Welcome to the VC Notes Coffee Talk Edition. I'm delighted to have a very special guest here with us today, somebody that many of you, if not all, will know as a household name. Um, Marshall Ramsey is with us today. He has a lot of jobs, a lot of things that he does. He's the editor at large at Mississippi Today. He is a cartoonist, a writer, a speaker, has a radio show. I'm sure I'm forgetting some things. Um, and I want to have him talk about that a little bit. He's also had some patient experiences that I'm going to ask him about to touch on. So thank you for being here with us today. You're an awfully busy man, but I appreciate you making time to come visit with us. I was absolutely terrified I owed y'all money and this was going to be an intervention. <laughs> I walked in, I'm like, wait a minute. And, and like I said, it's nice. It's always good to come up here and not have a bill. So well, it's a good well thing. great. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll be sure that you absolutely don't get a bill from this visit. Now, where did you park? Is what I parked? Let's just be sure you don't get a parking ticket. Oh, I parked ticket. in your spot. So <laughs> okay. is that okay? That's okay. Very That's good. perfectly so, fine. my household name like Charmin? Uh, well, not exactly like that, okay. but, but you get the idea. Just a second. So this um, message will go yes. out via email to everybody at the medical center, the faculty, the staff, the students, everybody across the medical center campus. Um, so as we're talking about this, just think about the, the things that you would want to share with that very broad audience. Okay. I know you have come to some events and spoken specifically mm -hmm. to our students before, but, um, but this will be kind of the whole medical center family um, that I hope will tune in and hear about this. So keeping in mind that, that we've got about 35 or 40 minutes for everything we want to talk about, give me the highlights of your career because you have done so many things. It's really fascinating. It's, it's, um, it's amazing. You Tell know, us kind of about your, your career. So I was talking last night to my old football coach, right? So I was interviewing a bass fisherman today and he's a bass. So I just wanted to get some questions. And he told me when I was in 10th grade, cause I got written up in the Atlanta newspaper that I, w I had potential. And he said, he, I remember he told me this when I was in 10th grade, potential is a little French word that means you're not worth a darn yet. Except oh, no. he, he didn't say darn, okay? So, but I mean, it was like it was like this work ethic just lit in me at that point. And mm -hmm. I remember telling my dad when I was eight, I said, I want to be an editorial cartoonist, which was the weirdest thing an eight-year-old could do tell. How do eight-year-olds know about that? Well, I grew up in Georgia, okay. and Jimmy Carter was running for president, and mm -hmm. we used to sit around the dinner table. Remember when people did that? Yeah. We sit around the dinner table talking about politics, my older wow. sisters and I, and my parents. And so I always loved the cartoons in the in the newspaper. They looked like Mad Magazine, you know, Jimmy Carter, yeah. Big Teeth and all that stuff. <laughs> and I said, I want to do that. Well, at the time, there was about 200 editorial cartoonists in the country. But my dad very wisely looked at me and he said, and you're going to be the best one ever. I love that. And so between Good that whole potential yeah. thing and, the, you know, just creating a work ethic mm -hmm. and having that, you know, literally that fire lit by my dad, who, you know, he got to see me actually achieve all this. But, you know, I got, I said, I'm going to be an editorial cartoonist. I'm going to do this. I graduated from the University of Tennessee and I became a high school janitor for a year. And uh, that was the best job I ever had. You probably got some great material for later cartoons. Oh, yeah. oh no, if yeah. you need me to come clean any of the hospital <laughs> stuff, I've got experience now. So definitely, no, I, I definitely understand education because I did that. But the bottom line was I ended up working with my now mother-in-law who introduced mm -hmm. me to my wife and it was the lesson that i kind of learned that you know even the worst moments can, can become the best moments mm -hmm. but now i found out about this job in 1996 i was out in san diego california which is absolute paradise it's a beautiful place to live but we wanted to get closer back to atlanta where our families are and uh, i re i gotta tell you this so they pick me up from the airport they drive me around give me a tour of jackson mississippi at 10 30 at night they drive me past umc and they said now there's a good place to go if you're ever shot oh and i was yes. like that is not a chamber of commerce moment so and, I was like, and what year was that that was 1996 yes so. yes a lot has changed since then. Right, I would come here yeah. for I come yeah. here for many other reasons <laughs> other than good. being shot. I hope that you're never. I have never been shot. So never that's have good. to come here for being shot. Knock very on good. Wood. Very so, good. Yeah. Very good. So, but I, that was a long answer. But no, I I am very blessed to get to do what I love to do. Mississippi today has been amazing. I've been there for four years now, or almost five. So it's it's been great. Was at the Clarion Ledger for twenty two. Um, I thought I'd be in Mississippi for two years, and I've been mm -hmm. here for nearly thirty. So you've ma basically made this your home. I have. You, you've raised, raised your boys. children mm -hmm. here. Okay. That's right. So how old are the boys? Old. 
<laughs> my oldest is 23. Uh, he's now off on his own and, and seeking new adventures. My middle one is 21 and a junior in college. And my youngest is 16 because every 55-year-old needs a 16-year-old. There you go. That's right. But, but you know, they're Mississippians. You're a Mississippian now. Yes, yeah. I am. Yeah, I, it's, that's it's, great. And actually, my great-great-grandfather founded a college here. So oh, wow. I should get some points for you that. Do. So, you yeah, do. You do. Wood get College some, you and get, Matheson. You get some points for yeah, that. Exactly. Absolutely. So um, you are not a healthcare professional, but I feel like you are a very astute observer and have, in fact, been a patient. I have several slept in a holiday in last yeah. night, definitely. <laughs> Not to give them a plug. And, but. and you have, um, you've been a cancer survivor. I've heard you speak mm -hmm. about that. And then just recently, before the camera started rolling, we were talking about your two spinal surgeries in two years. Yes. So from that standpoint, and it may be more than one thing that you want to say based on the different kinds of experiences you've had, what would you, from the patient voice, right. want to say to this ten or 13,000 people that may hear this? What, from the patient voice, what would you want to say? I can tell you this. If you're coming through the doors of this institution, which, by the way, I've gotten nothing but great care here. I'm a big fan. I run with several of the doctors that work here. I have several friends that are doctors here. Uh, one of my friends, uh, Michael A. Bear, who's mm -hmm. a researcher mm -hmm. here, and I went to high school together mm -hmm. over in Georgia. I mean, it's, and but also too now some of the first years and second years are mm -hmm. friends of my kids. You yeah. know, it's funny yeah. how the generations of I know the. Stop it. You're too young to be a doctor. Um, I've gotten, you know, I remember I spoke to the first year and I said, I know I'm not the smartest person in the room. <laughs> I can guarantee on that one. But when you come through the doors on this, generally you're facing a huge life situation, whether it's a crisis or not, but you're dealing with something that is overwhelming. This, I mean, this place can be overwhelming. Any hospital can. Uh, for me, when I first had my experience, it wasn't here, but I had to go to another another place, but I was diagnosed with malignant melanoma. Three doctors had missed it. And needless to say, that's not one you want three doctors missing. And I was very fortunate I got caught and I'm still alive. But that the, was more than 20 years ago, right? That was right? 2001. I was yeah. diagnosed on the day of the Mississippi flag vote. Okay. I'd been getting okay. threats all day. And then my doctor, Dr. Kenny Barraza, called me up and he said, yeah, yeah, you, you've got malignant melanoma. You have cancer. I'm sorry. And I just started laughing. And he's like, why are you laughing? Nicest call I've had all day. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, wow. But when you're in there, sometimes what you hear is like Charlie Brown's parents when mm -hmm. you're talking mm -hmm. with the medical. It's, it's so frightening. And you hear, want, 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 want cancer or mm -hmm. want, 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 want spinal fusion or whatever it is you're going to have to deal with. And so the humanity sometimes, it's like you've got to make sure, you know, I always bring somebody with me that's got mm -hmm. like no skin in the game so that they can help me translate on that. But, you know, like I said, the, the experiences I've had here is that the people are very kind and they're very caring and it's very human, um, which is good. What would you say to this audience that that is watching today about the patient perspective. Um, you know, you are not a healthcare provider, but you've certainly been on the other side of it a lot and a very astute observer of life. Mm -hmm. what, what would your message be about how it is from the patient perspective? You know, I grew up, my mom was really sick. She had cancer twice when I was a kid. And I remember being snuck into the hospital. They would sneak mm -hmm. me in the back way because they didn't let kids really in the hospital back in the mm -hmm. 70s. And so I would get snuck in. I remember how kind and how caring the nurses were. Mm -hmm. um, I've spoken at the Nightingale Awards before, and I've always told that story because I always appreciate it. It was something that stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And when I was diagnosed with cancer, I was really lucky. I mean, mine was malignant melanoma. It was more of a, hey, let's scoop out a grapefruit-sized chunk of Marshall's back and sew them up. Because it wasn't really a, a, a journey of, of great perseverance. It was just one of early detection. Mm -hmm. So I became an advocate of early detection on that. But I, I can tell you and I can tell everybody else that works here, when you're coming in as a patient, it's like you are facing probably the biggest crisis in your life. And even, I mean, even from a, my wife having a baby, which was the happiest moment, you know, three times that we've had in our life. But it still can be so overwhelming. And it's just remembering the humanity side of what you're dealing with. Because, you know, and I always talk about bedside manner, and I always joke with my my friends who are doctors here that I'm going to invite them over to my house and make them sit in my front room and read magazines until we serve them dinner, you know, that kind of thing. But, but it's just always remembering that just most of the time the people can't, you know, they're having a hard time processing what they're going through. And I know with me, because I mean, 
I got diagnosed um, two years ago with, with some, I had some real problems. I was losing control of my legs. I mean, ran a marathon at 50. And by the age 53, I could barely walk. I was in so much pain and mm. there was so much degeneration in my spine. And I don't, it wasn't really from the running, it was from the sitting in a chair during the pandemic for 17 hours a day for a year that caused that problem. And so I ended up having double fusion spinal surgery, which is literally like, oh, let's make you from 53 years old to 103 years old because the recovery on that is yeah. so difficult. And it was very humbling on that. But uh, I had incredibly good care on that and then you know, a few months ago, I hit my head and slipped a couple discs, nearly cut, severed my spinal cord. I mean, literally, I came within just a half inch of, or just just millimeters of, mm. of losing my legs. And once again, uh, my doctor, who is here at UMMC, um, was very compassionate and caring. He was on vacation, and he made sure that I was taken care of, and, mm. and I appreciate him doing that. So at the end of the day, I think it, my medical experiences are just reminding me of, of empathy and humanity, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I have found it here. And you know, I think um, people that go into a healthcare field, whatever the role is, yeah. that's what drives them right. at the beginning. That's what makes somebody say, I want to be a nurse, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a physical therapist, whatever it is. Um, so that, that um, urge is there from the beginning but what we have to guard against is the busyness and the hectic environment. And um, sometimes you feel overwhelmed and you have more to do than you can do. And, and I think that's when people get to that point where, um, you, you know, you have to take a second sometime and, and, and have that human connection with somebody else. That's right. um, but it's in there. You know, everybody that's doing this kind of work is doing it for that, for that reason. But... We all try to remind each other because at different points in time, you know, we're all patients. That's right. Um, and it's not fun to be a patient, but it certainly um, drives home that point about connecting as a human. And oh, I showing love the gowns. That. I like Show the gowns that are tied in the back. That's <laughs> kind of fun. Especially the paper ones. What about the paper the ones? Paper? Aren't they the best? You know, and I have a real thing. I, I just feel, I never like sitting on the paper on the tables. It just makes me feel like I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, it's just I, weird. I, I know. I know. Look, I will, I'm not going to try to trigger you here, but you remember the last three or four years have been kind of tough. They've been kind of tough. They've been kind of tough. And, and I know, tough. and as I said, I think everybody who walks these halls has, is unpacking their own trauma mm -hmm. in some way or whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, and it was really hard and I'm not going to go into the depths of the politics of the pandemic, but people were literally working and watching more. Like one of friend of mine was a respiratory, um, it worked in the I, mm -hmm. ICU, and, therapist. And the therapist, and he saw so many people pass away. He said, I saw more people die in a six month period than I saw, I've seen in my mm -hmm. whole 25 year career. Yeah. So it's like, there are a lot of people that just got tired and mm -hmm. just are exhausted, and but they're still getting up every day. They're doing their job, even though they may see stuff on Facebook that makes them feel like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I can't yeah. believe my friends are saying that. Yeah. But they're yeah. out there, they're still doing it. Yeah. And for me, that raised my level of respect for people in the healthcare just way above. I mean, I really firmly believe that there are a lot of heroes. Yeah. I gotta tell you, I woke up from, <laughs> The spinal surgery, the first one, the second one was a lot easier than the first one. The first one was tough. And I remember I was um, in recovery. They couldn't find me a room. And so it was just a little bit of a delay. And so I was chatty Cathy because I was on some incredible drugs at the time. <laughs> and, and I was talking to the nurse and I don't really remember the conversation. I get an email from her like four weeks later. She said, where's the cup with the nurse as a superhero that you promised me? I was like, well, I'm glad I didn't promise you too much else. You know, what else did I promise you? I was on that. So I promptly ordered her one and had it yes, shipped to her very on that. Good. So I appreciate very it. Very good. So. Very good. You know, I follow you on social media mm -hmm. and your um, cartoons especially, you find such the perfect, I think, sweet spot between political, um, witty, and a little sarcastic. You know, I think yeah. it's just that perfect blend of the three. Um, and on some of the social media, you know, you write pieces, um, some some yeah. of the just little short stories or observations or what have you. I have so much enjoyed the photography, though, yeah. also from these last, I don't know if it's been two years or a year, um, and what you title therapy walks yeah. um, in the morning. First of all, I'm just so impressed that you can and do get up and, and, and walk for an hour every morning because I know that is very good for your health and I know that you probably didn't have a choice when you got going on that. 
but it's great that you share your observations and your pictures with the rest of us because it's um, it's just always very cool and the pictures are great. Which is a miracle because I take them without my glasses. What, what? So, I mean, <laughs> thank God for the modern iPhone, you know. You, you see, I love the animal pictures especially, you know. Oh, I know. I get jump scared it's, by deer it's every amazing. morning. Yeah. That is amazing. So, um, I'm going to ask you about your own personal mm -hmm. favorite cartoon that you've done. I don't know if I would say this is my favorite. It had you in it, I bet, right? No, 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 okay. no. no. <laughs> Nobody ever likes the in, ones they're in. In my top at least maybe three um, mm -hmm. favorite ones would be the one one of the ones that you did, because I know you did several after 9-11. Yes. And, and it's just that, you know, on one day you've got Southerners, Northerners, liberals, mm -hmm. conservatives, blah, 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 blah. And then the next day we're all Americans. Yeah. Um, and then there, there are several from that time period that I repost every year because they just, um, I don't know, it just sums it up so well. And it's just such a beautiful capture of the moment. So I would say that's in my top two or three, maybe my favorite. But what's your favorite? I'm so curious because I know you've gotten national attention for some of these cartoons, mm -hmm. um, prize winning, you know. It, so there, there are some that have been really amplified at a national level. Which one's your favorite? You know, I, I've gotten, I've done over nine thousand <laughs> since I've been here. It's like, which one's your, which one of those nine thousand your favorite yeah, child? Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I think the 9-11 work and I think the Katrina work mm -hmm. because I think mm -hmm. both of those times were so dire. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. and even dire in the, you know, granted we're a long way away from ground zero here right. in Mississippi, right. but I mean, it was still, we For watched our country. it. We For watched our country. And we watched it live. We, we literally watched people die we right did. in front of our, our yes. just on a normal day and a beautiful blue sky day in New York. And I remember that. And I don't know about you. I remember that day like it was yesterday. Tell me what you were doing and where you are. I was standing in my kitchen with my oldest son in his high chair, and Amy and I were having a squabble about something stupid. And I saw they showed they cut to the World mm -hmm. Trade Center because we had like a little TV in the mm -hmm. now everybody mm -hmm. just stares at their phones. Right, right. But we had a little TV in there, and, and it was on the Today Show. And they cut to the cut to the World Trade Center, and it was a black hole. Mm -hmm. And see, I knew about the B-25 that had crashed there after World War mm. II, and that was during a foggy day. So I was like, a plane hit that? I knew something was wrong the second I saw it, because planes yeah. just don't, don't hit, hit a building that, that yeah. big. And then the second plane hit, and I was like, Amy, come here. Yeah. And we're watching something. this all happen. Yes. Yes. And I'm just sitting there looking over side eye at my child, thinking, what kind of world is he about to grow yeah. up in? Yeah. And then I drove into the Clear and Leisure, drove 50 miles an hour down 55 because everybody was in shock. Mm -hmm. Gas was $1.35 at Pump and Save in wow. front of the Jitney Jungle. Uh, I just remember these little details. And we get into the newsroom and they're like, we had to do an extra edition. I had to do the cartoon. Then between the two buildings falling, I drew the Statue of Liberty because they showed yes. the Statue of Liberty standing proudly before the smoke. So I drew it, yeah. you know, bent yeah. over. I know exactly you know. which picture yeah. you're talking about, yeah. And so that, but that day, I mean, that period, and I don't think I did a funny cartoon for weeks after mm -hmm. that, because you mm -hmm. couldn't. I mean, yeah, nobody you, was laughing. But well, yeah. you couldn't laugh, but you could also, and the fact that we came together as a country, mm -hmm. you know, and people are always like, well, that was a one-off, but we did it again after Katrina, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we, I always talk about chainsaws and casseroles. We are really good yeah. when there's, if there's like a tornado, we saw it in Rolling Fork. Yeah. You know, yeah. there were men's groups with cookers on their way before yes. literally the wind stopped blowing. And, and that's just what we do. Mm -hmm. And we did that with Katrina. And so when people always say, well, you know, we're, we're divided and everything else, there are times when we do come together. And, and those were two. And, and the Katrina stuff. And I was a Pulitzer finalist for the 9-11 work. I was a Pulitzer finalist for the Katrina work. So and that was a long time ago. But there, there's been recent cartoons, too, that I like. Uh, the Barbara Bush cartoon, yes, obviously. Yes, that's a favorite. was huge. Yes. People still, I, and I still tell that story. Um, Jenna ended up liking it, Bush uh, Hager. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. really loved it. Mm -hmm. And I got to meet her when she was here for Mistletoe, and that yeah. was wonderful. I uh, got to speak at the Bush Library. That's where the cartoons now reside. So, Wow. Um, but, you know, I also, I've got one of Burt Case and Kirk Fordyce together, which somebody gave me a copy signed by both of them, which oh, I, wow. I treasure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, some of the cartoons I've done recently, I've, I've been really happy with, too, because sometimes it's, you know, it's not the cartoon, it's the reaction, and it kind of makes me grin. So let me ask you this question, and it may be the kind of thing where it's the answer is just you never know. It's some of both. As you as this as these things um, 
you observe and, and feel and experience yeah. all these events and, and you make a cartoon from them, typically is it the kind of thing that just hits you, some image in your mind yeah. and you think, okay, I'm gonna do this, or do you think, now, how can I express this? And, and is it a thoughtful, let me figure this out, let me think about it kind of process, or is it a, you see it in your mind and you start drawing? Both, but it's better if it just flashes into my head. And, totally and the wrong. reason I ask that is because those events you described are things that, where it was a very... It was um, a flash. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and most of those were like cartoons of very few words too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, very good. Sometimes, you know, and a lot of it depends on fatigue. Uh, if I'm tired, it's harder. It's a harder process. I always say that, you know, we live in this world right here, this little circle, and then there's this realm out here where you reach out and grab stuff and pull it back mm -hmm. into the into the, into the the present. And that's kind of how that works for me. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is muscle memory. Even when, you know, I mean, I missed six cartoons after my first fusion. Wow. Um, I missed no cartoons after my melanoma surgery. I missed um, one cartoon after my second fusion surgery. So, wow. I mean, I, I'm pretty prolific, uh, and I generally don't miss. But, yeah, no, the idea is, because, I mean, it's like a well, you know, the more I read and the mm -hmm. more I, mm -hmm. I mean, I always said my cartoons for the first six months I lived in Mississippi were tone deaf because I didn't understand Mississippi. But, I mean, I've been here long <laughs> enough now, that, and I've traveled the state that I yeah. think I kind of get it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so tell us about your dog. Oh, Pip, oh, yeah. Pip is in a, you know, Pip, it has a, is in a lot of cartoons, the yeah. drawing sheets. I know Pip is a big part of what you do. Yeah, Pip was, um, you know, she's a, an 11 year old border terrier. Uh, if you ever saw something about Mary, the puffy, the dog in that, same kind of dog, it's like a little Benji. Mm -hmm. And she unfortunately has Cushing's and diabetes now, mm -hmm. and she's gotten cataracts, so she can't see very well. But when I had the surgery, I was, pretty much took about a year to recover on the, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I was up and moving after two or three months, but I mean, still, I was still working. I mean, you're not totally good to go until about a year. And she was always there. She was kind of my buddy, my pal, mm -hmm. my muse, uh, kept me busy because she always needed to go out. So mm -hmm. she bossed me mm -hmm. around and she still does. <laughs> Um, Get she you moving. And we yeah. had another dog named Banjo, which I did mm -hmm. a children's book yeah. on, and yeah. Pip was born the moment Banjo died. So, wow. And that's how we ended up with her. And she's had some health problems and it's been tough, but you know, we did the coloring sheets uh, during the pandemic and it was, I did one every day free of charge, just sent them out into the universe mm -hmm. to give people something to do. And um, she just kind of a reminder that, you know, the unconditional love mm -hmm. does exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only problem about dogs is they just don't live long enough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as you have gotten to know Mississippi and you live mm -hmm. here and this is your home and you've raised your family and traveled the state, thinking about the future of not just healthcare, but just the future of our state, yeah. what would you say are the top few things that really um, encourage you and that you feel optimistic about um, when you think about the future of Mississippi and kind of what, what, what um, what what the future may hold in the in the positive column, right? So, when I took the job here and we flew back, and I and my wife Amy said, well, "What'd you think about Mississippi?" I said, I "Don't think I ever saw it during the daylight during my interview. I was here a couple of days." But one thing I fell in love with back all those years ago was the people. Mm -hmm. I said, man, everybody I met was incredible. They're great stories. They're great storytellers. People were fascinating. They're, they're warm. They're kind. I mean, we lived out in Southern California. It was fine. It was, I mean, we had good friends there mm -hmm. and everything. But, you know, it's just something about the South. Mm -hmm. Mississippi's superpower, though, are its people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we got to get to the point where we all realize we're in the same boat, so we can't complain about that per side, person's side of the boat's mm -hmm. leaking. It's mm -hmm. like, well, no, wait, the whole boat's leaking right, on that. Right. But I think if somebody asked me, why have you stayed? Um, partly because this is obviously home, and that's where I've raised my kids, but also we have one of the best artists, artists musician, and writers community of any place in the mm -hmm. country, and it's totally accessible. And the fact that I've got friends that are literally world-class authors and so forth, and it's just, for me as a creative person, to be surrounded by that kind of talent makes me better. Mississippi makes you better, even the, the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we can talk about that too, um, but, the bad stuff makes you better too because it challenges you. It makes you think about where you stand and what you believe and, and what you think is right. And what, you know, and it's, there was a kind of a reckoning on how I viewed the world when I came here that I just never really had before. And I'm so grateful for it. 
Between that and then your own personal health issues, I, I, you, you probably wake up every day with a little extra dose of gratitude. Oh, that, you do. I mean, I, maybe not everybody else. I'm so corny with the sunrise pictures, you know, <laughs> but I do. I mean, I, I just am like, oh, wow, I got another shot. Yeah. And I have discovered, um, yeah, my health stuff. I mean, like I said, I, I, I told Amy, I said, I've been remarkably healthy other than the cancer and the two spinal surgeries and the knee surgery. And, you know, I mean, Except for that, it's great. I mean, I ran yeah. a marathon yeah. at 50. Yeah. I mean, yeah. come on. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I was, I was <laughs> been killing it. I, but I mean, I understand too that health is a big part of what I do. Mm -hmm. I've got to be healthy physically so I can be healthy mentally. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, I'm a big, obviously a big supporter of mental health, you know, support mm -hmm. for people to get proper mental mm -hmm. health care too, mm -hmm. because mental health is health. It's just all it is. It's all one unit, right? It really and so, is. And I it think really we is. got to get past that stigma on that also. So is there anything on your mind, this will be the last question, is there anything on your mind that you either expected me to ask you about today or that you thought, boy, I hope she does ask this because I want to say whatever it may be. Oh, I, was gonna, I thought you were going to definitely ask about the times I drew you in cartoons. <laughs> So, because so far you have not complained about your caricature well, at all. I, I, would it do any good? No, I'd make it worse. We'll see. There you no, go. I'd make so. it, ask Mike Moore about that. Now, that's old school, but just ask Mike Moore about what happened to his so, hair. Somehow I had a feeling that, you know, that, that you oh, weren't seeking you, though, input somebody, on So that. you're a person in power. What's it like when you open up and you see a cartoon? Is it like, do you get offended or do you realize, okay, maybe I've done something, you know, that makes me worthy of this? So, um. And you don't have to name the specific cartoon, well, but just, no. you know. So it has been sort of an adjustment for me personally right. to get to the place where I think I am now, but mm -hmm. certainly I wasn't when I started in this job, to either understand or, or accept that this is a sort of a public position. You're in the arena. Well, you are. and you know, I worked in, I'm an emergency medicine physician. I worked here in the adult ER, you know, great place to go if you get shot yeah. um, for years and years and years. And um, and so my identity was not as a public yeah, position. No, it, it is, was, yeah. I am a physician, I'm an emergency medicine physician, that's my identity. And so then rolling into this job, right. it took me a little while, some years, to either understand and or accept that it is, you know, sort of a public position in a way. Yeah. Um, not an elected position, but but still a public position and that people outside of what I consider my circle, you know, you talked about the small circle and the bigger circle yeah. and the bigger circle, that people outside of what I would really consider the circle um, have opinions about yes. what's happening or not happening and, and, and not everybody has the forum to express their opinion that you do, but you know, they have No, opinions. but I mean with social media, I get, I get emails, it's I different. get lots yeah, it's, it's of, a different you know, world now, definitely. Yeah, I, I definitely yeah. get a lot of input from people's opinions. And so that, you know, that took me a little while to adjust to that. And I do kind of get it, yeah. um, but it is a bit of an adjustment. So y there's still that bit of um, uneasiness, I guess, oh, a little totally bit understand. of just kind of yeah. like, oh, you know, where's this going to go? But um, one of the things that I guess early on really struck me, I'm the first female that's been mm -hmm. in this job. Yeah. How many women who are not even in healthcare at all, not in the healthcare world. So they're way outside what yeah. I consider the core circle or the core business have made comments about how much that meant to them. That's cool. And so that was when I first started thinking, oh, wow, you yeah. know, um, people are watching. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm, I am much more comfortable with it now than I was a few years ago, but it's still is a little anxiety provoking. <laughs> oh, no, that, I mean, no, I totally understand. And this may sound crazy, but I remember when I first started this, you know, it's like it was, people would shoot back, you know, and I was like, oh, <laughs> now I'm kind of like, oh, wow, they paid attention. Yeah, they yeah, saw yeah. it. That's good. Go and, ahead. It's and with fine. social media, obviously, people mm -hmm. have be, much they, more access, much 24 seven mm -hmm. if you let them and so forth. But I, I told my kids this. I said, look, if you're ever going to make a difference in this world, you're going to have to stick your head up out of the foxhole mm -hmm. and occasionally mm -hmm. things are going to come whizzing by. But you know what? That's where life is, and it that's is. where it makes a difference. And and I mean, like I said, your job's not easy. My job's my job's very easy, actually. I I don't have a I, real job, so I, I don't know that that um, you have to have a very strong and deep creative um, stream running through you to be able to 
day after day after day to do all the things that you do, whether it's cartoon or writing books or, you know, all the things. Um, that would be very hard. Three doctors miss my malignant melanoma. Mm -hmm. It is a blessing that I wake up every day. Wow. I've gotten 20 years of overtime, much more than that. And that's the way I view it. And I love Mississippi. Um, everything, it used to be I, my cartoons are driven by the fact that I was doing my job. Mm -hmm. Then I had children and I wanted Mississippi to be better for them. Now I want it to be better for other people's children. And, and I love this state. I'm here by choice. I'm not one by birth. I'm not a Mississippian by birth, but I am one by choice. Wow. I think that is absolutely the perfect way to end our conversation because that was just beautiful. So thank you. Well, thank thank you. you for being here with oh, us. This has been fun. It, it has yeah. been fun. I've enjoyed it a lot. And thank you all for everything that you do for the Medical Center mm -hmm. and for all of the Mississippians in our state. It's important and it matters. Thank you.